Um, last week we started, um, or we got into a text there in Colossians chapter 1 about how Jesus came from heaven to earth. Jesus came into our pit of despair. And the author of the story of reality, Jesus, the creator, he came into the world he created in order to save us because of his great love. One of the passages that we read last week is in verses 13 and 14. It says, God rescued us from dead end alleys and dark dungeons. He set us up in the kingdom of the son he loves so much. The son who got us out of the pit we were in. Who got rid of the sins we were doomed to keep repeating and before we continue this morning, I've got a short video clip that goes with that passage. A man fell in a hole. He fell in a hole, and he couldn't get out. A traveler passed by. He told the man to meditate, to purify his mind, and when he reached Nirvana, all suffering would cease. The man did as he was told, but he remained in the hole. Another man appeared. He explained that the hole didn't exist, and neither, in fact, did the man. It was all an illusion. The man who did not exist was still stuck in the hole that was not there. Another visitor arrived. He instructed the man to perform good deeds to improve his karma, and though he would still die in the hole, he might be reincarnated as something magnificent. Another man looked down from above. He taught the man to pray five times a day facing east and to follow five important tenets. If he was faithful, one day, perhaps, the divine would set him free. The man prayed as best he could, but he was losing strength. And in the hole he remained. Another man appeared. There was something different about him. He called down to the man in the hole and asked him if he wanted to be free. This man lowered himself into the earth, into the pit. He took hold of the man and dragged him into the light. And the man in the hole, who could not get himself out, was saved. This morning, Paul, in our continuation there of chapter 1, is going to talk to us about this man who climbed in the hole to save us. Let's pick it up. Colossians 1, starting in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace 
through his blood shed on the cross. We're going to work through some of these truths this morning, but, but let's just cut to the big bottom line here that I'm sure you saw. Here it is. It's on your outline this morning as well. It's that Jesus is the God-man who is alone able to reconcile us, to reconcile a fallen humanity to the Creator who loves us. Jesus was a man. He got hungry. He got tired from time to time. He took naps. He slept. When he worked hard, he could work up a sweat. If you cut Jesus, he bled. And we, humanity, we needed a real Savior. You see, a fairy tale Savior can't save real people. Jesus is a real Savior. Born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, flesh and blood person. Consider how so many outside the Bible, outside of our tradition of faith, historically have written about Jesus. Roman historian and philosopher Pliny wrote about Jesus in the first century. Roman senator and historian Tacitus wrote about Jesus. A Greek playwright named Lucian and historian wrote about Jesus. Roman historian Josephus wrote about Jesus. Why why did they write about Jesus? Why bother with this guy who lived this relatively short life because he made an impact on history because he was a real person? Because his life changed their world. Now, the four Gospels do a very good job of talking about the 33-year life of Jesus on earth. We learn about his friendships. We learn some about his family. We learn quite a bit about his ministry. We learn a lot about his message. We learn about his ups and downs. We learn about his death. We learn about his resurrection. But there's more than that. You see, the New Testament doesn't just deal with those 33 years. They tell us about the entirety of the life of Jesus. His story did not begin with his birth in Bethlehem. In fact, Paul is going to tell us the story of Jesus. It has no beginning. He has no beginning. He was a man, but he was God. So write this down. Jesus is not a God. Jesus is the God, according to Paul. And before we dig into the text we read a moment ago, I just want us to recognize Paul, he's not writing a one-off piece. This is not Paul kind of lost it here, and he's talking about Jesus being divine in ways no one else did. I mean, this is throughout the New Testament, this idea of Jesus being divine. 100% God, 100% man. Last week we started at the very beginning of the story of reality. The first words in the Bible, in the beginning, God. And Paul is going to tell us in this text that Jesus was there. At the beginning, Jesus was the key actor. In fact, he was there before the beginning. But I want to go to John, the Gospel of John, because he starts with that same in the beginning idea. John teases that out for us. John says in the first verse and following, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, 
He was coming into the world. He came into the world. Think about this. <laughs> he came into the world. He created. But the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. So the Word became flesh. The Word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Jesus is, is the God-man who alone can rescue humanity. Now, I get it. It's hard, and that's probably an understatement, to hold on to both of these truths at the same time. I mean, I think we can hold on to one or the other at the same time. Whether you are a believer or not, you can construct some notion of an omnipotent God in your head. You can hold on to that. You can think about that. And certainly, we can hold on to the notion of what a real human being is like. We have that experience every day. But God and man together in the same person, it's hard. It's hard to fathom. But it's important to acknowledge the divinity of Jesus Christ. You see, the gap between us, between God and us, could only be bridged by someone who was both God and and us. The Word became flesh, John 1, 14. And then Hebrews chapter 1. Notice the same themes from Colossians 1, from John 1. We have them all here in Hebrews chapter 1. The writer, probably a medical doctor named Luke, wrote these words. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he, what? He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe... By the word of his power, after making purification for sins, for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so throughout the New Testament, the writers speak to this one-of-a-kind, unique identity of Jesus. He was a person. He was born, he died, he bled if you cut him. And he was God the creator God of the universe. The person called the Word is the very one who started everything. He is the author of reality, and he is the one who came into his creation in order to make things right. Now, an English philosopher who lived back in the 1300s named John Wycliffe, I think, summed this up very well. The uniqueness of Jesus' identity and why we needed a Savior like Jesus. Listen to what he wrote. Trust wholly in Christ. Rely altogether on his sufferings. Beware of seeking to be justified by any other way than by his righteousness. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient for salvation. There must be atonement made for sin according to the righteousness of God. And the person to make this atonement must be God and man. The author of the story wrote himself into the story so that people could be forgiven, so that people could be set right. And that author is Jesus. 
Now, six truths there from Colossians chapter 1 and from those other passages in Hebrews and John as well, but we'll focus on Colossians chapter 1 this morning. Six truths about the unique identity of Jesus. First, he says in verse 15, is he is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. Write this on your outline this morning. Jesus is the visible image of God. You want to know about God? Look at Jesus. You want to see the Father? Look at Jesus. He is God made visible. While something of God can be seen in nature, you may have a spiritual experience looking at the the starry sky at night or listening to the roar of the ocean. Not here in Dallas, probably. You may see something of God in the beauty and intricacy of of mathematics. You may see something of the divine nature in the way a mother looks at her newborn child. You may see something of God in a beautiful orchestral piece. But they all pale in comparison to God made visible in Jesus. The exact representation of the Father. And the Spirit reveals also in this text that Jesus, He lived here among us, yes, but He's not really part of the created world. He's not created. Yeah, He was born in Bethlehem, but He was born into His world, the world He created. You see, Paul tells us in verse 15 that He existed before anything was created. Before there were planets, before there were galaxies, before there were atoms, before there were quarks and gluons and photons, he existed. Write this down. Jesus existed before creation. He existed before creation. Before Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God. Before that, Jesus. And verse 16. All things were created by him and for him. All things were created by him and for him. Write this down. Jesus is the creator of all things. He's the creator God. Big picture, right? We're talking about stars and galaxies and distant planets owe their existence to Jesus. Little picture, the world under a microscope, even an electron microscope, subatomic domain, world of quantum physics. Jesus is the glue holding it all together. From the planetary to the personal, Paul says this in verse 17 In everything, he might have the supremacy, he's the sovereign. So write this down. Jesus has supremacy in all things. Reading an article this week by MIT professor, Nobel Prize winning physicist, Frank Wilczek. He is not, to my knowledge, a, a Christian, a believer. But he wrote, he's written a lot that I think points to the reality we're talking about this morning. I want you to listen to this piece of text he wrote. Thus far, our meditation on quantum reality has revealed that the world of everyday matter, when properly understood, embodies concepts of extraordinary beauty. Indeed, ordinary matter is built up from atoms that are, in a rich and precise sense, tiny musical instruments. In their interplay with light, they realize a mathematical music of the spheres that surpasses the visions of Pythagoras, Plato, and Kepler. In molecules and ordered materials, these atomic instruments play together as harmonious ensembles and synchronized orchestras. And Paul would tell us the conductor of the orchestra is Jesus. 
He is the one keeping the beat. And the music of reality only stops when he chooses to set his baton down. All things created by Jesus, all things held together by Jesus, he has supremacy. Basically, let's get personal here. This means we are house guests in his universe. He stands at the beginning of creation. He conducts the music of reality. And the music only stops playing when he decides it stops playing. This is what Paul says in verse 19. God was pleased to have what? All his fullness. Every part of him, 100% of his divinity, all his fullness dwell in him. Jesus is, on the outline, 100% God. You've heard that before. He's 100% God. That passage in John, verse 2, says, The Word was fully God. Here's why all this matters in a, I think, a very personal way for us. The author of the story of reality came into his creation so that we could be reconciled to him. So that we could be brought back together in harmony with, with his music. Every person, you, me, everybody, <laughs> since Adam and Eve, we have chosen to sin. We have chosen to rebel. We have created by our own acts and our own thoughts and our own words an insurpassable gulf, a Grand Canyon-sized gulf between ourselves and the holy, righteous God who created us. We are all lawbreakers we are all guilty. And Jesus is the only one who can bridge that gap. When Jesus gave his life, Colossians 1, verse 20, he was making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Say that with me. Making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So Jesus bridged the gap between God and us on the cross. The cross. It's kind of surprising, really, that sometimes there is great beauty even in a tragedy. The cross. I mean, I think about it today, so many years later, the beautiful image suspended over cathedrals and churches around the world. The cross on a, on a shiny gold necklace around someone's neck. The, the cross tattooed into a professional athlete's skin. <laughs> the cross etched into marble. Today, it's, it's held out. It's worn with pride. And though it was a place of misery and humiliation and pain, the cross is beautiful. Sometimes there is great beauty in a tragedy. Y'all remember the story just a couple of years back out of San Bernardino, California, the massacre there. 27-year-old Denise Peraza was a survivor. She tells her story. And... Denise had her life spared not because the shooters had bad aim, not because they saw her and decided to choose another target. Her life was spared because a man named Shannon Johnson covered her up with his own body, sheltered her, saved her, and in the end gave up his life for her. Here are her words about this day. She says, It was Wednesday morning, 10.55 a.m. We were seated next to each other at a table, joking about how the large clock on the wall might be broken because time seemed to be moving so slowly. 
I would have never guessed that only five minutes later we would be huddled next to each other under the same table using a fallen chair as a shield from over 60 rounds of bullets being fired across the room. While I cannot recall every single second that played out that morning, I will always remember his left arm wrapped around me, holding me as close as possible next to him behind that chair. And amidst all the chaos, I will always remember him saying these three words, I got you. And Johnson died, interposing his body between her and the killers, sheltering her from that rain of bullets. Jesus, on the cross, shielded us from the wrath of God. He took the punishment headed our way. He took it on his body as he was beaten, pierced, hung on a wooden cross until he died. I got you. Those are his words for you. I got you. The eternal God came from heaven to earth, to rescue you. He has promised he will never leave you, he will never forsake you, and this morning, those are his words to you, I got you, I got you. And maybe for you it is crossing that line of faith, letting him pull you out of the pit, letting the author of the story, the creator of the universe, give you his gift of salvation. You can do that by confessing your faith in his name, repenting of your sins, putting him on in baptism. You can do that today. Or maybe you just need prayers. He loves you. He listens. He answers, to our, he answers our prayers. And if you need to pray, we'd encourage you to do that. But whatever you need to do to get right with God this morning or to cry out to God this morning, we would encourage you to do that as we stand together and worship.